Hey everyone, Yan Zhao here. Gonna do a little bit of drawing today. Sorry for the late start. Just having a little bit of problems getting the uh, cameras and the mics to work. So give me just a second to get set up and then I'll get started. see it's pretty much done I've got some uh, stuff I need to fill in here uh, it's just supposed to be errata stuff that's not necessarily in the um, in crates but it's just kind of hanging out things that are bigger don't know what yet haven't gotten there but uh, for the moment what I really need this for is just to add some lines which I think too be a little bit easier um, if I grab a I need to grab a another cable and if I can find one Nope, I don't have it. All right, so we'll just get going with this. So we do there. Okay. Entry. We've got cloakroom. A couple of offices. out. Okay, so what I've got going on here is um, I have a museum. So Gonna have an entryway down here. And then we're gonna have uh, behind it is a little like info desk. Behind that, we've got um, some offices, maybe some storage, probably be a passageway to go to the basement. Um, then above that, we've got simply the. Um, uh, this is a gift shop because if you go into the museum, you're gonna get. You don't want like 
tourist crap, right? And then in the far corner of the structure, this is actually uh, for a museum of like natural history. So this is like creatures and native beliefs of the elves who live in the area. Uh, it's somewhat like a P.T. Barnum type setup. Down here, we've got a um, history of South Bay, uh, which is the town where we start. And then this is going to be a history of the Western League. So the Western League is the nation that controls South Bay. So I'm just going to do a little bit of connecting the dots here. Um, and I'm actually going to go to inking pretty darn quick, uh, but Just need to make sure that this is more or less correct here. And if things are off a little bit, I can always change them up later in Photoshop. And yes, if you're watching, the paper is a little bit crinkled. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see there. So that looks straight. This seems to be off a bit. Yeah, so I finally got my computer back, got this streaming stuff working. Um, what I need now is more or less just to uh, get some music and less time next time, less time. Next time, this will be less boring, I promise. Doesn't 
straight. No, it is straight. Okay. Hey, Dungeon Delver, how are you? Ah, patrons only. What's the topic today? I think you should be able to hear me, so hopefully you'll get that. All right, here we go. All right, and back in action. Uh oh. Seemed to be a bit laggy. What is going on? Oh, no. Well, no, it's laggy. <laughs> okay. Oh, the worst D and D module ever. Um, is that talk about the barista module? Yeah, I've actually been given some thought about that. And, um, whew, you know, it kind of brings up a lot of, a lot of thoughts about whether or not the barista thing is actually a good idea or not such a good idea. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. Um, I think it's, not a good I think the barista one is not a good idea in the sense that um, nobody wants to play it. <laughs> like how many people are gonna buy that? But you know, maybe this is somebody who's young. Maybe this is like their first time ever. And um, you know, they uh, they're just making a making a module for the first time. It would be hard for me to kind of crap on someone for that. Uh, however, it is a bit um, hmm, lackluster. But, you know, there's this condition, which, you know, I wasn't prepared for the stream. I can't think of the name to it, but where people can't visualize things in their mind. Uh so what I mean is like, if you tell someone, um, you know, oh, how would it have been if you had taken a trip to Europe last summer? And then their answer to you would be, well, I didn't take a trip to, last, to Europe last summer. Well, no, no, no. But if you did, what would it have been like? And um, they would say, but I didn't didn't take that trip. And the reason that they give you those kind of answers is because they cannot themselves imagine something like they cannot picture stuff in their mind. You know, if I say like, don't imagine uh, pink elephants in your bedroom, they would not they would not, uh, they'd be like, yeah, cool, I won't, because they can't. Uh, just a passerby. Uh, nope, I did not. Uh, to me, it's an issue of like, let's say you have a coworker, Bob, and Bob is colorblind. And Bob 
dresses in like neon green and purple, sort of like the Joker, right? Would it be wrong for you to just laugh at the guy? In polite society, we would say, okay, we'll just ignore it. Now, the problem comes in, what if Bob wants to be in charge of the company's new uniforms? Um, I would say at that point, you got to step in and be like, yo, Bob, Bob, you're a cool guy. We like you, but no. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are. You know, if, if somebody wants to write a module about being a barista, okay. I mean, would it be so much different from writing a module about you work in a tavern and something's going down and they recruit you? I mean, remember, Bilbo is just some dude hanging out in his home who got recruited by a bunch of dwarves to go steal stuff from a dragon. So, you know, when when it comes down to it, uh, that is not necessarily a bad starting place. Um, but... It's more the implementation. You know, why Why would we have that? Why would people want to play that? Uh, and I think people don't. So I think the question is, where in this process, uh, you know, are we really making fun of the barista idea? Is it, let's say, some 17-year-old kid who's trying to write a module for the first time and that's all he knows so he kind of took the uh took the phrase write what you know a little bit too literally um i don't know you know i i wouldn't necessarily make fun of a guy for that however you know whoever did this did publish it on dm's guild and dm's guild is professional ish like pro-am, shall we call it? Um, so, you know, at what point do we say, uh, you know, Bill, as much as I'm sure your fashion sense is great, um, we do not want to wear fluorescent orange and lime green shirts to work. So not that it was good, but, and it wasn't actually made by Wizards of the Coast. So, you know, I'm not going to condemn them for that. Wizards of the Coast is perfectly happy to take 50% of whatever that, uh, that module sold, which like, you know, after all this controversy, I can see it actually selling quite a bit, but I think Perhaps originally, you know, it would have been like whoever wrote it and maybe he or she had like two or three really good friends who would give it like a pity buy. Because when I'm living my fantasy life, I could be out killing orcs. I could be out slaying dragons. You know what I'm not doing? Serving coffee to people. Let's see. That module is about being a barista simulator. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're not exactly wrong. It's like, um, it's like for someone who watched the show Friends, and in their fantasy, they didn't want to be one of the friends. They wanted to be Gunther. But um, in all seriousness, I really can see this as being, you know, something done by someone who they they can only envision what they know you know they don't have the ability to imagine something to picture something else in their mind so i can totally see whoever wrote this as you know just 
doing the best that they can. And the best that they could think of was being a barista. Now, I, I'm not going to crap on someone for, you know, making some kind of a, of a home brew like that. But I will say, I don't think anybody wants to play it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly my point. You're right, Dungeon Deller. So just for anyone who's not actually watching, my problem is, though, that it's almost heartbreakingly imaginatively stunted. Uh, and then you go on to say, like, has life beaten you down that badly? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly who wrote this. You know, so it's like, um, you know, it's like you got that family member who likes to paint, but they haven't actually had any lessons and, you know, like, God bless them, they're trying. Or they really want to, you know, some of those singers you see on like, uh, not Mass Singer, what's that one that uh, America's Got Talent or, the, or that? other stupid one I can't think of the name of where they go on and it's like, they're not just like joking around, horsing around to get on TV. Like they really think they're going to be on there and you listen to them and you're like, Oh God, you know, like, you know, in general, in polite society, we'd just be like, Oh, very nice. That was great, Tim. Or, Oh, very original. Um, but it would be considered rude if it was like you like let's say you're listening to this at church and afterwards you were like you sucked you know that's maybe a little too much um but yeah you know somebody needs to step in and be like yo this is what we need to do um and i can kind of see that on the dm's guild end like maybe Uh, maybe somebody there, there needs to be a little bit more editorial, you know, I don't know. I mean, for them, it's just extra cash. And I have to say, I do like the idea of you being able to write up your own modules and having a place to sell them legitimately. Now, I think giving away 50% of your profits is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but you know, that's pretty good. And in some ways, you see this also in Japan in the manga community. Um, there is a, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a mechanism. So you could take original characters, like you can take Goku from Dragon Ball Z, and you can make an original story with him, uh, use all the, all these, you know, copyrighted characters and sell them at conventions. So, you know, you can print up 500 copies of your thing and try to sell them out and you can do it legally. Now you have to pay a certain fee. Um, but since it's not like a, like a mass publication, you know, it's fanfic basically they'll totally let you do that. So I like that mechanism, you know, where you let fans go from, you know, low level to more of a pro and then, uh, but whatever company is still owning that. Let's see. That in anything other than terms of our escapism <laughs> is that our life is only marginally less awful. <laughs> it's unimaginable. It's just sad. Oh, hey. And my first Russian porn. Let me uh, block that guy there. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, it is sad. It is sad. But, you know... First of all, is the person who wrote it capable of imaginable thought? Like somewhere in the 10 to 15% of range of the population is not able to do computer work, right? Not because they're evil or they haven't been trained. It's because they just don't have the intelligence. 
Um, they don't have the IQ for it. So what we have to ask is, you know, was the person who wrote this really capable of that thought? Uh, I don't know. From what I read, you know, and I haven't read the whole module. I did not buy it. But it's questionable to me um, whether this person is, you know, that that able to think things through. Um, now, in the question of your life being sad, sure. Yeah, it sounds horrible. I mean, if you think about it, there are certain people, let's say somebody told you going to school for like a sociology degree would be a good bet for your life. And well, you probably spent like 80 grand and, you know, interest is accruing on those loans. You don't have to pay it back until you graduate, but interest is accruing on those things while you're at school. So now you're, I don't know, 100, 150 grand in the hole. All you've got is a sociology degree. Come to find out nobody really wants or needs sociologists. Um, the only places that are going to hire you are being a, a barista, you know, there's a far too many people who are like that in the U.S. these days, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I could see someone who's maybe struggling mentally. They're, they're kind of doing that. Maybe they're trying to make their lives seem a little bit more exceptional than they actually are when to the outside audience. Well, I get the same reaction you do, Dungeon Delver. Like, oh, man. Um, and that's a, a bigger societal problem than I think Dungeons and Dragons can deal with. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but yeah, it's not a module I would play. And uh, I do think to an extent that, um, you know, escapist content is really low, right? Like one of the big problems was uh, the YA movement, in my opinion. And what's wrong with YA is that, you know, it kind of gets people into four groups you know, whatever four groups there are, um, it could be, you know, the, was it the 12 districts? It could divide people like that. Let's see. Agreed. Bigger problem. If you task me with doing something with this module, first I would throw out the barista and make it tavern keeper. Second, I'd make it high level. Yeah, well, you know, you, you could do a lot with this module, to be perfectly honest, with the premise. Let's see. Yep, exactly. That's where I was thinking. That's exactly where you could go with it. Uh, if you were going to go to the low level, like maybe a party of adventurers, like, confuses you for somebody else. And uh, they bring you along, even though you're just a barista. They think you're an ex-adventurer in hiding. Uh, and so you sort of get into adventuring that way, dragging you out of your existence of trying to pay back that loan. I mean, there's a lot you could do with it. Maybe uh, you are an expert assassin who has a cover job as a barista. And instead of brewing up coffee, you're really brewing up poisons all day and somebody's going to hire you to go on a mission. You know, there's a million things that, uh, that you could do. Now, what I, in my adventures, maybe have some, uh, maybe have like some mechanics for making coffee. You know, I'd probably do it just to be silly, just to flavor it. You know, I have, uh, what is that, civic coffee where the coffee beans go, 
are excreted out of a, an animal's butt, you know, I would have that so I could uh, basically thumb my nose at the hoi polloi of whatever city my players happen to be in. Um, so, you know, the, people with a little bit of imagination, you could take that idea and just run with it. You know, you could make something of it. For the, un for the unfortunate person who, you know, put this up there, oof. Now, in my heart of hearts, I hope this guy was really like, okay, this is part one. This is just the initial concept. And I'm going to post more in the series later. And you can buy them each, you know, like a dollar for each part of the adventure or something. Unfortunately, I'm like 90% sure that is not what happened. So I am just uh, blocking out some things here. Uh, I've got to go over it later, which I think I definitely need to do. Um, so unfortunately, I am out of slots. To run, uh, to run things. I've got a light box, which I would normally put under this. Uh, I had a big, I, I made a, like I printed out a big grid. So this paper is 11 by 17 where I could have that under here and then work on everything on the grid, but I don't know what the heck happened to it. It's very strange. But, uh, so I was trying to use some graph paper and I ran out of uh, it's good, but the lines are thin blue, and they're kind of hard to see. I've got a light box, but I'm out of outlets to plug it into. So let's see. IPAs are poison anyway. Ooh. I, see, now I know some people who would stab you for that. That's how you start a fight. <laughs> Make them a microbrewer IPA tavern keeper. <laughs> Go drink some Duff beer. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think, uh, if you had like a brewery, a brewery, have an adventure at one of those, that would be pretty fun. So this, um, uh, this museum is basically my info dump central for the uh, campaign I'm working on. Um, had a little issue the first time around. People were like, ah, we don't really understand what's going on in the world. To which I say, cool, cool. Uh, I had expected my first playtest group to actually ask, you know, go talk to people and say, hey, uh, what's this thing with the government? What's going on with the elves? What's this? What's that? Uh, they never did any of that. So I figured I had to be a little more heavy handed. So I moved the inciting adventure. Um, it is going to start in this uh, museum. So depending on how it goes, you're either tasked with uh, finding some thieves who want to break in, or you get hired as the thieves that want to break in. Um, but there's, you know, a part at the beginning where you are casing the joint, or if you're not casing the joint, you've got to go in and sort of assess its security uh, apparatus. So as you do, you pass by a bunch of uh, you know, like maps on the wall that explain like the history, how this country grew and whatnot. You have artifacts to explain like the level of technology and what kind of weapons. And uh, there's a lot of like propaganda in this world as in pretty much all others elves are oppressed and uh, oppressed. And uh, there's a lot of like propaganda calling them in their beliefs primitive and whatnot. And so, um, you know, you 
it's pretty blatant propaganda as I have it written uh, because it's supposed to inform the player that, you know, maybe there's a little something more than meets the eye going on here. What can I say? I'm a sucker for things that taste good, not like boiled used neoprene gym mats. Oh, you've you've had multi? Uh, I got to tell you, Bill, when I lived in China, um, there's a drink called Baijiu, which literally just means white alcohol or clear. And uh, there's this brand called Maltai. It tastes friggin' horrible. It is the worst, uh, but it's expensive. So everybody over there loves it. It becomes like the de facto gift you should give people because the more expensive something is, then clearly the better it is to buy. That's also how they pick wine. Like what's the most expensive bottle of wine? That's what you're gonna buy someone to give as a gift. Um, so they had this other one, which was, you know, Maltai could be like 100, 150 US dollars per bottle, you know, and, um, they had this other cheap stuff, which is for the plebes. It was in a green bottle and oh my God, this thing tasted like, uh, diesel. It was like diesel, but sticky. So even after you drank it, the, that horrible diesel taste would stick in your, coat your mouth and your throat. It was awful. It was awful. I once made the mistake of buying that stuff. First time I had had it, when I was getting on a train, right? And it was a train at night, so there was nothing, nothing you could buy. And I was stuck with diesel in my mouth until we got wherever we were going in the morning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally true. Um, it's not just expensive wine. I think part of the problem is a lot of times they'll buy like those really dry red wines, which are like, oof, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty tough to take. So yeah, they'll mix it with Sprite. Now, in Chinese people's defense, I have seen other people do that too. I've seen college students in the U.S. do that. Uh, I've seen some, uh, I hate to say it, but I have seen some Europeans do it, even though most of them would tell you that's that's like the gravest sin you could ever commit. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. Putting Sprite in it kind of makes it like a wine cooler, a slightly bubbly wine cooler. But uh, yeah, the fun thing was when I lived there, I lived there like 06 to 2010. And like that stuff was just coming into like the general population at the time. Before that, you would have to be like some super rich mucky muck, or maybe you had something to do with foreigners. But um, at that point, the average Chinese could actually afford it. I mean, it'd be expensive, but you could afford some decent foreign imported stuff. <laughs> Sprite is expensive. Tailings from one of the 330 million factories they have there. Well, you know, you might not be wrong. Um, there were a lot of places, like actually... If you're going to drink in China, beer is one of the best things to drink just because you're pretty sure it was bottled in a real factory, whereas the market for fake alcohol is huge. Like uh, every time I would go out of China and then back in, people would beg me to get alcohol duty free because they would know that Johnny Walker Blue Label wouldn't poison you. Whereas if you bought it in China... Sure, you could. Um, were you sure it was real? 
Uh, heck no, you weren't. In fact, there's a good chance it wasn't. Uh, yeah, I know. I know those two guys. Um, I like Winston, but, uh, sea milk. Uh, I, I can't stand that guy. He, I don't know that guy, man, his logic is so off that, um, you know, he happens to be right on a lot of things that he says. Um, but I think some of that is more luck than brains. Um, I'll give you a, a specific example. He always wants to crap on Chinese medicine. And then he'll say, like, it's BS. It's totally worthless. But when he gets down to it, it's like because, you know, Chinese doctors are unprofessional and this and that. And it's like, well, what does that have to do with Chinese medicine? Absolutely nothing, you know. And uh, also he cites this website called sciencebasedmedicine.org. Sciencebasedmedicine.org is like the least scientific uh, group that you could find because it's all a big circle jerk. So I take what he says um, with a grain of salt. Now, a lot of the stuff he says is correct. His Chinese is uh, really good and his translation. I've never seen, uh, I still speak Chinese very well. My reading's a little questionable, but I've never seen them uh, misrepresent things. Um, but, you know, sometimes they make a little too much out of nothing. Uh, you know, he's pretty quick to make fun of people for things that he doesn't you could say like either he doesn't like or support or seem strange to him, uh, you know, which could be like, oh, they eat this thing here or that thing, or, you know, they do this activity that's kind of neutral. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other things that he's correct on. Uh, they were some of the first people talking about what's going on with the Uyghurs, um, which to my understanding is true. Uh, when I was there, I think it was, it was either 2008 or 2009, um, there were some Uyghur separatists who, depending on who you ask, might have had links to the Taliban. And these guys uh, went to a train station. I can't remember. I think it was Ermici, uh, which was the capital of uh, Xinjiang, or other people call it uh, East Turkmenistan, uh, that is part of China now, but at one point wasn't. And uh, they just knifed a bunch of people waiting outside at the at the stop. And that's when China really went full ham. And um, you saw all sorts of Uyghur restaurants closed down in Beijing. In Beijing, nothing was going on. Um, you know, a lot of people were very cautious. Uh, they always liked me because they knew I wasn't Chinese. If they found out I was American, they liked me even better. But after that, they were very, very cautious around me because they didn't want to be seen, you know, talking to someone who was potentially a foreign forces or a foreign spy. Um, and you saw a lot of other stuff. Uh, I'm someone who's very close to me, uh, was arrested um, 2020. I'm pretty sure he's dead now. Uh, I'm not really... Nobody knows what happens. I've got a lot of people who I consider family back in China. And, um, you know, we have to be very careful if we're talking about this guy. Because, um, you know, if you ask too many questions, you're the next one who's arrested. But um, he has been known to get drunk and say things about certain leadership. Uh, so, you know, we, those of us in the family outside of China... Uh, we we had thought that he, you know, had <laughs> stopped doing that, but that could be. The other problem is when uh, the Wuhan flu, which was what the Chinese government was calling it at the time, when that came out, he happened to be in Turkey. And he went there with his daughter on a vacation. So uh, he was posting all sorts of videos on uh, WeChat. WeChat is kind of like a mix between Twitter and Facebook. 
uh, most popular one in China. So he was posting things on there, like dressing up in like Turkish costumes, uh, going to eat, you know, like fancy Turkish food and stuff, things that you would do on vacation. Um, and, you know, a bunch of people were telling him like, yo, bro, read the room, you know, shit's going down right now in China. And a lot of people are afraid, you know, you got to watch what you're saying. Um, so it could have something to do with that too. I remember when he was in Turkey, I, I contacted him and I sent him a message and I'm like, Hey man, uh, you know, things don't seem to be going very well in China right now. Um, if you need to get out, you know, go straight from Turkey or get a visa to the U S uh, come here. You can stay with me for a little while. And then, uh, my brother lives in Rio de Janeiro. He's got a Kung Fu school down there. Uh, so my friend, he could have gone and lived in Rio. Uh, there would have been work for him. There would have been business, you know, and he could have rode things out until it was safer to go back. Uh, but I remember he just laughed. He's like, no, no, it's not bad. And I talked to him like a week or two after he got back. Um, we, we had some business. I was helping him to translate a book and, um, he's like, oh yeah, things are fine or whatever. You know, and I kind of left cryptic message like, oh, you know, maybe you should go to Brazil to uh, promote this book we're working on. He's like, no, no, things are fine. And then like two weeks later, he just sort of disappears, you know, and we start asking around like, hey, do you know where he went? Uh, we need we need some info for this book. No one's heard from him since. Uh, now, we did get word last year for the Chinese New Year, like, oh, no, it'll be fine. He'll be out, you know, after the New Year. That came and went. This year's Chinese New Year came and went. So uh, where is he now? I have no idea. But um, they they do regularly take organs from prisoners. Hey, Mobius. Um you know, so they could have thought, oh, you know, this guy's in good shape. <laughs> Clearly, they, did, they didn't check his liver uh, and took his organs. Um, and I know a lot of people think that's fake, but, you know, I, I went to school there for medicine. And uh, when we were doing hospital rotations, they were doing a lot of organ transplants. And, uh, you know, I was asking some of the doctors and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, this guy... He's, uh, we got him set up in two weeks for a new organ. And I was like, holy crap, how did you know when somebody would die? Like, how do you know, do you have that many car accidents with like similar blood types and stuff? And um, they just kind of look at me strange me. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. People in China don't do donate their organs. Where, where are you guys getting these from? And they were like, oh, all right, Yan Zhao, you can go to this other department now. And so, you know, I knew something was up at the time, but um, I thought it was from, you know, people who are sentenced to die and then they harvest the organs. That's apparently not the truth. <laughs> apparently what's going on is when you when you're arrested for something serious or what they consider serious, they'll they'll type you, they'll type your organs, you know, your DNA. And if somebody who's got money matches, then um that's it for you. So the answer to your question, Dungeon Delver, is yes, I've seen them. Yeah, but in general, they're pretty good. Their stuff is pretty accurate. But I take everything with a grain of salt.
Well, oh, that's a good question. Are you telling me that Dutch sports journalist was close to getting parted out for spares? Well, if it wasn't during the Olympics, yeah. Uh, he could have been. So the one thing was when I was there, it was before the, oh, well, I was there before and then after the 08 Olympics. And so at that time, you were relatively safe if you were a foreigner. Um, and by relatively safe, what I mean is, um, you know, you could still be arrested for stuff. I knew people who were arrested, but they weren't going to do too much to you because they were afraid of, uh, you know, how the world would react. Uh, so they were trying to keep a lot of the nonsense on the DL. Um, there was also a different president. So things were really kind of opening up, to be perfectly honest. I was there at a fantastic time. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, it was great. Uh, Chinese people were more open. They could see all the BS that was going on there at the time. They knew that the news and everything was propaganda. Um, but younger people, for some reason, don't seem to understand that distinction. And I'm not sure why. I don't know exactly what happened. But uh, yeah, I mean, if the world wasn't watching when that happened um, and he was arrested these days, yeah, he could be missing his organs. He would have, you know, China would have said he disappeared or they would have claimed he was selling drugs or something like that. Those are pretty standard uh, MOs. But uh, there is a reason why I can't go back to China. Let's see. Do not watch sports news. <laughs> yeah, of course they do, man. They need body parts from somewhere. Uh, that being said, when... Oh, like that Canadian? Oh, you mean the two they just snatched? Yeah, 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 the two Michaels. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, what had happened was um, there was a, a woman, I think her name was Meng Zhou Hua, or Hua Meng Zhou, uh, who is the daughter of the chairman of Huawei. So Huawei is probably the biggest electronics company in the world, and they sell a lot of um, communications parts. You know, and part of that is China wants to get them into every communication grid in the world so they can spy on all these com countries' communication. Pretty much like we had been doing uh, with the stuff that Edward Snowden came out with. So at any rate, um, this lady uh, had been accused by the U.S. of selling tech to Iran, you know, in violation of our pro of our sanctions at the time. And so she was going through Canada. We asked Canada to pick her up. Uh, because we can do that based on treaties, uh, and they did, and they wouldn't let her go. So China, there were two Canadian executives. I can't remember. I think one was like a mining executive who, you know, they sell their raw materials to China. And um, the Chinese government picked the guy up, you know, and that that was it. And then there was another one. And they were in jail for several years. So, you know, what um, What were their crimes? Uh, you know, pretty much nothing. They were just political pawns. And uh, the world has pretty much said, eh, whatever. Uh, they're free now because uh, Meng Zhou was released earlier this year um, the current president do, president does not have the same uh, 
views that what she was doing was criminal. So she was let go. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty bad situation. I mean, you got to feel bad for the guy's family. But there's a lot of stories like that. Yep. Yep. They let the Michaels go. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> it's been fun hanging out with you guys, uh, but the wife needs me to go grill up some meat, and I have yet to let her down when it comes to that challenge. So thanks a lot for stopping by. I'll probably do some more draw streams, trying to get at least one a week. It also helps me keep motivated so I can actually get these projects done. Um, thanks a lot. If you could give it a like, if you're not subscribed, subscribe, and I'll see you guys back soon.